Welcome to Lecture 4, Seeing the Light. If you think about it, most of your information about the world around you, for most of us anyway, probably comes from light waves. A lot of the rest of it comes from sound, and that means much of our information about the world around us comes from waves of one sort or another. But we can't just get these waves hitting our bodies. We also have to have these waves form images so we can see what it is we're looking at. And we form those images with our own eyes. We also form them with a vast array of instruments from telescopes and microscopes to cameras, movie projectors, um, slide viewers, CD players that have to image that laser beam that reads the information off the pits on the CD, and so on and so on. Uh, image forming equipment in nature and in our technological society is really ubiquitous. How do we form images? How do we image, how do we make representations of the world with light waves? Well, the key is in the phenomenon of refraction that I covered in the last lecture. Let me remind you that refraction is the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. And the example I used last time was this simple rectangular block of plastic. Here I have the same laser I had before, except now it's got five beams coming out instead of one. And we can see that each of these beams, when it enters the block at an angle, uh, bends, in fact, uh, more toward the direction perpendicular to that interface between the air and the glass. There's some funny stuff going on with this one over here. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. But basically, those light beams are bent, and then they bend back as they come out. That doesn't do much for us in terms of forming images. What we need to do is to develop a shaped object that bends light in such a way that light waves converge on a single point. And an object like that is called a lens. And in this simple demonstration system I have here, I have a number of lenses that have different properties and allow us to understand how this process of image formation works. So let me begin with a simple lens. Again, a lens is an object whose edges are shaped in such a way that this refraction of light occurs to bring light waves together at a single point, or sometimes not to bring them together, as we'll see. So here's an example of a lens. And you can see what that lens does. It takes light rays that are essentially coming in on one side of the lens, all parallel to each other. They hit the first interface between air and glass, air and plastic in this case, and they bend slightly. Um, the one that's hitting head-on in the middle doesn't bend at all, but some of the others bend more, and then they bend again as they go out. And the shapes of those two surfaces are such that the light is brought to a focus at a single point here, and I'm just going to mark that point so we'll have it. And that's called the focal point F of that particular lens. So this lens, lens number one, has the characteristic that it takes parallel light and it brings it together at a focus at that single point that I've marked F. In fact, I'm going to call that F1 because that's the focal point for lens number one. And this distance from the lens to that point is called the focal length of the lens or the focal distance. Here's lens two. Lens two, you'll notice, has a little more curvature to its surfaces. It's a stronger lens. It brings light to a focus at a different point. There's F2, the focal point of lens 2. There's the focal distance of lens 2. It's shorter. Um, we characterize lenses, we describe lenses by a single number, namely the focal length or the distance from the lens to its focal point. And that number, or rather the inverse of that number, is something you've probably heard of if you've ever had eyeglasses or contact lenses prescribed. That's the diopter measure of the lenses. For example, I have in my right eye right now a 2.0 diopter contact lens, plus 2.0 diopter. I could have had a minus 2.0 diopter lens, but I wouldn't have been able to see anything if that was the case. More on that in a few minutes. Um, what is that diopter measure? What does that two diopters mean? That's simply the inverse of the focal length in meters. So if I take one over two, that's one half. Um, the focal length of that contact lens is one half a meter. It means if I put that focal length on my board over there, it would be half a meter, about 18 inches, 20 inches, roughly 19, 20 inches, um, from where the lens was to its focal point. These lenses have considerably shorter focal distances, and therefore, if you take the inverse of their focal distances, you get a bigger number. These are stronger lenses than my contact lens. Um, this distance might be about, oh, six inches. Six inches is about a sixth or seventh of a meter, so this is about a six or seven diopter lens. That's what that diopter measure means. That's positive diopter measurements. I'll give you a sense in a little bit about what negative diopter measure means also. But the point is, we can characterize lenses, these things which are shaped carefully to bend light and bring it together at a common focus so that um, 
they, we, we characterize them by that one number that basically tells how quickly or how rapidly in space that happens, how strong the lens is, how quickly it converges those rays together. Now, an ideal lens brings all the rays together right at a single point, and lens 2 is pretty good. All those rays are crossing at that single point marked F2. Lens 1 was a good lens also. All those rays were crossing at that single point marked F1, pretty much crossing at that single point. Uh, lenses aren't perfect. If I have a rather crude lens, this semicircular object, uh, you can see that the rays are definitely not all crossing at the same point. That lens wouldn't do a very good job of bringing light to a focus, and if we tried to form images with it, um, it wouldn't work very well. This is a spherical lens, um, or a, in this case, a circular lens. In three dimensions, it would be a part of a spherical surface. It would be a hemisphere, and it doesn't do a very good job. In fact, lenses only work when their surfaces are curves that are only rather small portions of spheres. In fact, ideally, they should be some other shape but we tend to make lenses essentially spherical, and they, to a pretty good extent, then bring light together at a single focus, as does uh, my lens 2 here, for example. By the way, you may have heard of the lens defect called spherical aberration. Um, that's due to the fact that spherical lens surfaces are not exactly perfect at bringing light together at a focus, and spherical aberration measures just a little bit how far off they are from that. Lenses suffer from a number of defects, Spherical aberration is a common one. Um, they also suffer from the fact that different colors of light are refracted by different amounts, and consequently, um, they may bring different colors to focus at slightly different points, causing colored images to be slightly out of focus. Um, some lenses, again, in two dimensions, it's not an issue, but in three dimensions, a lens may have one curvature in one direction, a slightly different curvature in the other direction, so the focal lengths will be different for parallel light coming in two different planes. Um, that's called astigmatism. Many of you may have astigmatism in your eyes. It means your lens is not perfectly circular, but has a cylindrical aspect to it. It's got more curvature in one direction than another. So real lenses, including the ones nature has provided us with, or the ones that we manufacture technological suffer from a variety of these defects. Now, how do these lenses form images? All I've done with my demonstration lenses over here so far is to show you how parallel light is brought to a single focus. Um, to understand image formation, it suffices to know just two things about lenses, and those two things are fairly obvious from what's going on over here on the board. First of all, if I have a light ray that passes right through the center of the lens, it comes out approximately undeflected. You can see that's pretty strictly true for the one that's going right through the center here, but even if the light rays were not parallel, the one that's going through the center, it's deflected a little bit. Let's get that one a little better centered. The one that's going through the center is deflected a little bit, and then it comes back out in exactly the same direction it was going, because the two surfaces of the lens at that point are essentially parallel. So a light ray that passes through the center of the lens, whether it does so parallel to the lens axis or not, comes out essentially undeflected. That's not exactly true because the thickness of the lens offsets it a little bit. So in the, in the approximation that lenses are very, very thin, thin compared to what? Thin compared to their curvature radius, then that will be true. So one thing you need to remember about lenses is any, lens that pa any light that passes through the center of the lens, undeflected. On the other hand, as I showed with my first lens demonstration, any light that passes parallel uh, to the lens axis comes through and is deflected to the focus. Let's make that happen again. So here it is. And that's really all we need to know. Two things about light passing through lenses. Light that passes through the center of the lens comes through undeflected, and light that passes through parallel to the axis of the lens comes through and is deflected to the focus. It's all we need to know. So let's move on and take a look at how images are formed. First, I'm going to erase these focal lengths because we won't need them anymore. So let's take a look at how images actually form. Here I've got a picture that shows a single lens, and I'm going to now try now to form an image of an object. All I did on the board over there was look at focusing of parallel light rays. I didn't say anything about images, about objects that are trying to be imaged, that we're trying to form images of. So here we go. Here's an, uh, a lens. Here's its focal point. I need to know where its focal point is to figure out how it's going to make images. There's that lens axis, uh, light rays passing parallel to that axis will be deflected through the focal point. Light rays passing through the center of the lens will go through undeflected. Here's an object. Typically, we draw very simple objects when we're talking about imaging, maybe a tree, maybe an arrow. And all we really need to do here is to figure out where light from the tip of the arrow is going to end up. 
if we're to form an image, an accurate, well-focused image, then all the light rays that are leaving the point of the arrow have to end up at the same place. Similarly, all light rays leaving the bottom of the arrow have to end up at the same place, but that's going to happen very simply. You can almost see that from the symmetry of the situation. So we're going to focus on the light leaving the tip of the arrow. We want to know where that light ends up. So here comes a ray of light that's moving parallel to the lens axis. We know what happens to light that moves parallel to the lens axis. As the demonstration on the board shows, it's brought to a deflected state that takes it through the focal point. So here it goes. So light from the tip of the arrow that happens to be moving parallel to the lens uh, axis ends up going through the focal point. Now there's light coming from the tip of that arrow in all directions. Presumably it's illuminated by the sun or by some light source. It's coming out in all directions, but some light ray is going parallel, and that light ray is going to be deflected through the focal point. Some other light ray leaving the tip of that arrow is going to be heading in just the right direction to take it through the center of the lens. And again, in the approximation that the lens is very thin, thin compared to the curvature radius of those spherical surfaces that make up the lens, that ray goes through undeflected. Of course, it gets a little tiny bit deflected in and deflected back out, but the deflection is very, very small. So all I need to draw, do is draw that second ray, the one that is, def that is uh, coming off the tip of the arrow in such a direction that it goes through the center of the lens. There it is. And those two rays meet at a single point. And I'm not going to prove it here rigorously, but if we drew every other ray that came off that arrow hand and went through the lens, if the lens is working correctly, if it's got nice spherical surfaces, um, all those other rays will also end up crossing at exactly that same point. So by knowing those two special rays, the one that runs parallel to the lens axis and the one that goes through the center of the lens, we have everything we need to know to reconstruct the image. Now, it's pretty obvious that light from the bottom of the arrow coming along the axis of the lens has to end up on the axis of the lens. And consequently, uh, we know that the bottom of the arrow is going to end up on the axis. We now know where the tip of the arrow's image is going to be. It's going to be at the point where those two rays cross, and so we can draw the image, and there it is. This particular formation of an image is a formation of an enlarged image. The image arrow is larger than the uh, actual object itself, and the image is inverted. It's upside down. And this particular image is called a real image. It's called a real image because, in a sense, it's really there. If you were to look into this system from what is the right in this diagram, you would actually see light leaving the tip of that image arrow. There is actually light coming from where that image is. That's why it's called a real image. You might say, is there such a thing as an unreal image? Well, there is, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But this particular one is a real image, and it's a magnified real image, and it's inverted. If I were, for example, to put a uh, white reflective white screen at the place where that real image is, I would see the image on the screen. In fact, this is a rather crude model of a movie or a slide projector. In a movie or a slide projector, the object is the transparency, the slide or movie. It goes into the projector upside down. An enlarged real image is formed on a distant screen, and the uh, real image is right side up because the object itself was upside down. The image is always inverted. Um, in a real movie projector or slide projector, the object is much, much closer, uh, and um, the image is formed much further away and has much greater magnification, but that's how that kind of lens works. Your eye also works this way. It forms a real inverted image on the retina at the back of your eye, and a camera forms a real inverted image on either film or, more in modern cameras, a charge-coupled device, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So that's the formation of a real image. Um, well, what about objects that have... Uh, not, what about non-real images? Well, there are non-real images, and they're called virtual images. And you, one can form a virtual image by putting an object closer to the lens than the focal point. In this diagram of real image formation, you'll notice that the object is a little bit further away than the focal point. As I move it in toward the focal point, the real image moves further out and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But if I put the object right at the focal point, a real image never forms. The light rays are made parallel, and they just travel off to infinity and never form an image. And if I move the object in even closer than the focal length, something interesting happens. So here it is. So here's a lens. Could be the same lens. Uh, the object is in very close to the lens. We're going to apply the same rule. It's in closer than the focal length. There's the focal point. We know that light rays leaving parallel to the lens axis go through the focal point. So there's a light ray leaving parallel to the lens axis. It's brought through the focal point, just like before. We also know what happens to light rays that 
uh, go through the center of the lens. They come out undeflected. So there's a light ray coming through the center of the lens. The problem is the object is so close to the lens now, closer than the focal distance, that those two rays don't converge. They don't form an image. They don't come to a single point where they cross. In fact, they're diverging. They're spreading apart. But here's what's interesting. If you were looking into this picture from the bottom right, looking at those light rays, it looks like they are coming from a common point. That common point is up here. It looks like they're coming from that point. They aren't really coming from that point. They're really coming from the object, and then the lens is doing funny things to them and deflecting them. But it looks like they're coming to that common point. So it looks to you, looking into the lens that way, like there is an enlarged object. You can see it's enlarged because the height of the object is much greater. And that image, which is an image which you see when you look through a lens at an object which is on the other side of the lens, much closer than the focal distance, is called a virtual image. Virtual because it's not really there. There is not really light. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's an image, but there's nothing really there. There's no light coming from there. It only looks as though light's coming from there. And a very common use of virtual uh, image formation is to take an object like a magnifying glass. Here's a nice antique lens. It preserves as a magnifying glass. And uh, look at, for example, my notes here. And what I see is in a large picture of my notes, I'm seeing a virtual image of my notes. The image is behind the lens somewhere. Or the light looks like it's coming from behind the lens, but light isn't really coming from the point where the virtual image seems to be. But nevertheless, I see this enlarged enlargement of the, of the text on the notes from this simple magnifying glass. This same lens could make both real images and virtual images depending on whether the object is placed closer to the lens than the focal distance or further away. So that's the formation of a virtual image. Now, you'll notice that with both these images, I used exactly the same kind of lens. It was a, a lens that was concave, it, 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 uh, or convex, I'm sorry. It was a convex lens. The, the sides of the lens both bulged out. By the way, it would have still worked if one side had been flat and another had bulged out. It even would have worked if one was concave and one was convex, provided the lens got thicker in the middle. That kind of lens is called a converging lens. It brings parallel light rays together at a focus. There's another kind of lens called a diverging lens, and let me go over to my blackboard again and put on a diverging lens. Here, here's the converging lens. It brings light rays together at a focus. Here's a diverging lens. It sends light rays apart. They look like they're coming from a focus that's over here somewhere. So in a sense, the focal distance of this one is, re in, is reversed and uh, to handle that mathematically, we assign this one a negative focal distance. Those of you who are nearsighted, as opposed to me, I'm farsighted, those of you who are nearsighted have negative diopter prescriptions for your eyeglasses and contact lenses because you need diverging lenses. And I'll show you why in just a minute. So these diverging lenses can never form real images because the light is never being brought together to focus, but they can form uh, virtual images and that's what they do for you in your eyeglasses. Well, let's look at your eyes a little bit and see how your eyes work. Um, first of all, let's look at a normal eye. And I'm going to put up here a little eye diagram and get it aligned right with the laser. Okay, so here I have a source of parallel light. And here I have what would be a normal eye. If you have a normal eye, there's a lens, there's actually also in front of the lens this transparent layer called the cornea, and most of the refraction actually occurs at the cornea. So the eye doesn't have just a single refractive element. It has the cornea and then it has a lens. And the lens actually, particularly in younger people, a set of muscles can adjust the curvature of the lens to focus at nearer and farther distances. And what happens to most of us as we get older is that lens becomes stiffer and it can no longer make that adjustment. And that's when we begin to start needing, for example, reading glasses. So it's a little more complicated than this diagram would suggest, but but there is a normal eye, and a normal eye brings parallel light together at a focus uh, at the back of the eye. So let's take a little bit more look here at the eye's um, anatomy to see what's going on actually. At the front is the cornea, which is again shaped somewhat lens-like to provide some of the refraction that brings that light together. Behind that is a lens, that's the movable, deformable element that allows you to adjust the focus. At the back is the retina, that's where the image is formed and then captured by uh, cells, special cells called rods and cones that convert that to nerve impulses and send it to your brain. So here is going to be a farsighted eye. A farsighted eye has a lens that is 
a little bit too weak. It doesn't deflect the light enough. It ends up focusing the light behind your retina, or it would have focused the light behind your retina if the light could have gone through your retina. So that's a, uh, a lens which is too weak. So if I go to my model, that would be a model of a defective eye, defective in the sense of being farsighted. I happen to be farsighted, so I'll pick on this one. And you can see the light has not yet converged to a focus at the point it hits the retina. It's converging to a focus somewhere behind the retina. So that's a farsighted eye. Um, let's pause a second. Let me ask you to stop your DVD player for a minute or your VHS player, your, your um, uh, video cassette player, and pause a minute and think, what would you do to correct this? The lens is not strong enough. It's not converging the light tightly enough to a focus. What would you do? Well, what you would do is put something in front of there that would make the convergence happen more uh, dramatically, something that would add a little extra convergence. So you'd put a lens that would achieve more convergence, something like this. Okay? I'm going to put another converging lens in front of the too weak convergence of my cornea and my internal lens. That converging lens is going to take those rays of light that are coming from the object. It's going to bring them a little bit more tightly together so that when they get to my eye, my eye can bring them together at the focus. I've suggested the converging lens looks like all these other lenses I've been drawing. It might actually be shaped more like that, especially if it were a contact lens. So that's what I'm going to do over here. I'm going to take a slightly converging lens, not a very strong one, but a little bit. I'm going to put it here in front of the eye, and now the light is coming together at pretty much the retina, focused at the right place, and I've corrected that vision. So those of you who have positive diopter measurements on your contact lenses or your glasses, your vision is corrected in this way with a converging lens in front of the eye. That's correction of farsightedness. What about nearsightedness? Um, nearsightedness is the opposite condition. Um, in nearsightedness, the eye is too strong. It focuses the light to a focus before it hits the retina. So here it is, and by the time the light reaches the retina, it's no longer in focus. So what are you going to do? Pause a minute and think about that. Well, what you're going to do is diverge those rays somewhat so that you won't have that problem. So that you put a lens in that spreads those rays a little bit further apart, so by the time the converging lenses get working on them in your eye, they'll bring them together at the focus at the right place. So by correcting nearsightedness, we're going to put a diverging lens, something like that. I'll show you in a minute. It doesn't actually look like that. It's going to take the light that's headed toward your eye, spread it a bit further apart, so by the time it hits your eye, the focus will be in the right place. The diverging lenses typically don't actually look like that. Again, all that matters is that they be thinner at the center. That's enough to make them diverging lenses, so they might look something like that. So let's go over and do that on our uh, model eye over here. So there's the lens that was stronger. That was my number two lens that had the shorter focal distance, and that number two lens brings things to a focus before the retina, and so we need to spread things out a little bit, and so we'll put a diverging lens in front, and again, we've achieved a perfect focus. So that's how eyeglasses and, in general, vision correction works. We simply put lenses in front of the eye that compensate for those problems, and if we understand those simple two rays, the one that goes through the center of the lens and the one that goes parallel to the axis, that's all we really need to understand the correction of the most simple vision problems. Correct astigmatism is a little more involved. You have to make a new lens with itself, different shapes um, to, uh, to handle the different curvatures. And if you want a contact lens that corrects astigmatism, that's a real problem because you've got to make sure the contact lens floats into the right orientation so it's got to be weighted. That gets a little complicated. If you want a more permanent vision correction, you can go in for laser surgery. How does that work? Well, in laser vision correction, uh, you basically take a laser, much more about lasers in Lecture 34. Um, the lasers that are used in laser vision correction can actually etch words into a human hair. They're that precise. And they uh, ablate off, burn off, boil off, uh, sp uh, sputter off little tiny bits of matter at the eye. And typically what they do is uh, take the center of the cornea, uh, they First, remove surgically, flip back the cornea and the outer layer, and they uh, just reshape the cornea slightly in such a way, as you can see in the rightmost frame in this picture, um, the lens is now a little bit thinner than it was at the center, and that makes it a little bit more diverging. It cuts down on the converging properties. Remember, the nearsighted person was too, had too strong a lens. It was converging too much, and so this solves that problem. Laser vision correction also works for, for uh, farsightedness, which is what I have, but it doesn't work quite as well because it's not as easy to make the cornea thicker in the center. You have to ablate stuff away from the edges, and that's a little harder to do. 
And so those of us who are farsighted are slightly worse candidates for laser vision correction, although it can still be done. So that's a more modern uh, vision correction technique, which basically uses still the same principles of optics. Um, that's single lenses. Uh, putting an uh, extra lens in front of your eyes makes a more complicated instrument, your eye lenses, plus these additional lenses. Um, we've made all kinds of scientific instruments, telescopes, microscopes, which typically involve using one lens, or in the case of astronomical telescopes, a mirror to form an image. And then uh, a second lens looks at that image, that's the eyepiece lens, magnifies it, looks at it, makes a virtual image, and we see that. So uh, that's the development of telescopes and microscopes. Microscopy, again, as I said in the last lecture, is limited because we can't look at objects much smaller than the wavelength of light. So we've developed a whole host of new microscope techniques that don't use optics and get around that issue. Now, once we've made images, sometimes we'd like to save those images. The images you're watching on your screen right now have been captured, saved to some medium. In fact, initially they were saved to high quality uh, beta magnetic tape and later transferred to DVD. Um, how does that work? Well, in old-fashioned cameras, we use film, which is simply a chemical medium that changes chemical properties when light hits it, and the whole complicated, slow development process you take film through then brings out that image that was stored chemically in the film. Uh, di uh, film cameras are decreasing rapidly in popularity. They've been replaced by digital cameras, and digital cameras use devices called charge-coupled devices. There are several other kinds of devices. But I just want to give you a sense of how a modern uh, camera works, how a modern camera remembers its images. So here's an example of a charge-coupled device. Um, a charge-coupled device can be thought of as sort of like a bunch of, like an egg carton. Now think of an empty egg carton, and you throw into this egg carton some little pellets, and each little pellet represents a certain amount of light. And the more light coming into an individual little well in the egg carton, uh, the, the brighter the light, and therefore the more of these pellets. Well, those pellets are electrons. And in a charge-coupled device, one typically has an array of these light-sensitive sites. They're called photocytes or pixels. A pixel is a common word that you'll hear in the digital era. So here is a representation of that. This particular camera, if this were a camera, has 1, 2, 3, 4 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 4 times 6. That's 24 pixels. A typical camera today has maybe 5 million pixels. Uh, a camera I happened to look at just before coming here had 2272 by 1704 pixels. If you multiply those two numbers together, you get close to 4 million. So that's a 4 megapixel camera. So this is a very small number of pixels. We really have millions and millions of them in our camera. So here comes light through the lens of the camera. And each of these red particles coming in is a little particle of light, a little bundle of light energy. And when it hits the CCD array, it releases an electron. So the red particle, the light disappears, and in its place, there forms an electron. So here we've collected a bunch of light in this charge coupled device. That is some kind of image. It shows a region that looks sort of like, oh, I don't know, maybe a little bit like the letter F, kind of out of focus. Um, but there's regions where there's more light has, has in the image and regions where there's less light. And so now we've got this array, this egg crate kind of thing with electrons filling the bins, and we'd like to get those electrons out of there. So the beautiful thing about a charge coupled device is the charge can be coupled from one of these bins to the next. The electrons can be moved to the next bin. So what happens is electronically, we apply electronic signals for some electronic circuitry that first shift all those electrons one bin over, then another bin over, then they begin to come out of the CCD and they're registered by the electronic circuitry, which registers the amount and eventually stores it in a computer memory or whatever. Next, next, and now we've got that row read out. Then we start reading out the next row and so on. And you get the picture. So that's how a charge-coupled device works. That's how we store images. Cameras, our eyes, uh, VHS tape, beta tape, uh, digital uh, camcorders, all these things record actual images, focused light. But there's another way to form an image, and that's actually to capture the light rays as if they were coming to your eye and recreate that light as if it's coming to your eye. That doesn't form an image, but instead it forms something more complicated, whereas if you look at it, you see the actual scene you were looking at in three dimensions. That's called a hologram. A hologram is made by, by interfering light that's bouncing off an object from a laser with light coming directly from the laser, what that, and then recording that on film or in some other medium. What that does is to create the actual wave fronts that were coming at you exactly as they were, and you can actually see things in three dimensions. And I have here, at the end of this lecture, a movie that 
uh, was made. It's from the MIT Media Lab, and it's a, I can't show this well in two dimensions, but I'll do the best I can. It's a movie that shows um, a hologram of a car, and the fact that it's three-dimensional is indicated by the fact that as we move the hologram around, you see the car from different angles. You are really seeing essentially a three-dimensional image. And I think in the coming decades, we can expect to see full-length movies, maybe on Blu-ray DVDs or something, that are actually holographic and appear not on a screen, but in full three dimensions.